Hi, everybody, and thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, this evening we have Bill Peters and Nathan Larson. And I just want to quickly thank P Punkcast for recording tonight and Akashic for uh, the introduction that um, Jamie Temple is going to do after I introduce Bill Peters. He'll introduce Nathan. And so. Bill Peters grew up in Rochester, New York, and has received fiction fellowships from the Massachusetts Council, uh, Cultural Council and the University of Massachusetts. His work has previously appeared in, I hate pronouncing this journal's name, but they're so good. Say it for me. Ladies? Thank you. OK. He currently lives in Gainesville, Florida. This is his first novel. Yay. Uh, Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming out, and uh, thank you, St. Mark's Bookshop, for, for having me, and uh, thank you, Nathan, for, uh, for doing a lot of the driving on this. Uh, it's, uh, this is my first time doing something like this, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't have asked for a better person to, to oh, do this with. So. Aw. Um, all right, uh, so uh, I hope we have enough love in the room now, yeah. but uh, anyway, so uh, I, I, I've, I've written a book titled Maverick Jet Pants in the City of Quality, which is out. Uh, from Black Balloon Publishing, uh, and it's about, uh, it takes place in 1999 in Rochester, New York, and uh, it's about a, uh, a kid named Nate who spends a good portion of the book wondering if his best friend, Necro, is a domestic terrorist or just moving on with his life. Uh, so, um, I, I'll just go ahead and read from the first chapter, which is called The Rochester Classic Drive Around. The night before our friendship ends and the city burns down and the Colonel Hellstash begins forever, I change out of my Bill's pajama pants into my Bill's sweatpants and drive Mom's car into the snow crust to find Necro. My last friend left even when I first met him. Past the main Applebee's, past the Arondicoid Applebee's, past the Dollar Theater, I slow down to see if Necro's vomit cruiser is in any lot anywhere before giving up on Rochester's outside towns and heading to the city. In a field along 490, the moon's reflection spreads out on a long layer of ice. Downtown, the skyline's five buildings are lit up and deserted, but my, but my joke Rolodex is stocked. I have one-liners Necro will totally crack up at if I find him tonight. Joke's worth a holy grail point for every message I've left on its robot voice message machine for the last 13 nights. In other words, 71 holy grail points. Down Monroe, Past Mark's Texas Hots, where it's crowded enough to fog the windows, but early enough not to need a door guard. I keep driving. Past a man sleeping outside the theater entrance of Monroe Show World. Past the McDonald's that is sometimes out of hamburgers, where, for a second, I think I see him. Necro's tall mantis Langfest, his wreath of unponytailed hair, the cardboard-colored Necro parka, but it's just some frizz-haired lady wearing snow pants and Reebok pumps, standing at the drive through speaker, ordering. So no Necro tonight. And when I can't find Necro, I drive past the Bills bars I can't get into yet to look for Toby, who I go find when I want to see him go off the top ropes on someone. But I see no milk bag neck fat, no shaven heads or moon man Bills jackets, no Toby. And when I can't find Toby, I drive past the 7-Eleven powered only by an iron lung to look for lip cheese, who I can at least rip on, although it's way better when it's me and Necro and Toby ripping on him. And when I can't find lip cheese, I look to see if I'll finally do it, the sadness custard montage. Because I can feel some dials turning in my tear ducts. Because I am probably friendship dead weight now. And now I can cry myself out of Colonel Hellstash, Nate, and maybe into Platinum Merman Card Gold Membership, Nate, who has plans beyond doing Rochester Classic drive arounds every night, who isn't afraid to apply for jobs and wouldn't be embarrassed about messing up the cash register subtotal in front of everyone and who could remember at night to set a vitamin on the counter for the next morning and wake up early enough to eat breakfast like a man if needed. I pull into the lot of the Blockbuster on Goodman. The stores brighten my mirrors. I turn off the car and shorten my breath. You're finally ready, says the sadness custard flight attendant. And I try to find a way to let the sadness custard montage happen because sadness custard montages are rare as comets. I'm still 0 for 5 going through with one. I couldn't even cry when Norwood missed that kick in 1991. And right when I start to get really amped, like I don't even care who sees me, like this is a goddamn Mountain Dew commercial, the inside of my chest turns into sealed Tupperware. Fortunately, me and the Tupperware feeling go way back. So as a detour, I look for the guilt-like feeling I get whenever I look at mom's coffee mug with the golden retriever sketched onto it, but all I do is grind my teeth. 
So I tell myself, someday your parents will be dead, asshole. And if you can't feel sadness, custard montage, then how long are you going to wait until some woman, who maybe you could have married, who I can't even picture, finally takes me aside and says, oh my god, you sociopath. And when I can't find any of that, I lean forward and hug the steering wheel. Outside the store entrance, a man with a gray buzz cut and a white dolphin's jacket is straddling a BMX and looking at me. So I drive home. The one floor houses and gates have muddy front yards and longish driveways. The kitchen light is off in my house, a shingly juice drink carton on gillet, and the TV is on in the living room. Mom doesn't look over when I untie my shoes. Home, I say? She's still in her rib-high work pantsuit, pouring the one glass of Sam Adams she allows herself each, each night. She sets the glass underneath the paper towel rack in the corner of our tree fort sized kitchen like she's hiding it. Then she goes into the living room, so when she wants a sip, she has to go back into the kitchen, creating a hassle for herself. I check the refrigerator for post-its. No Nate Necro called. No Toby co called. Not even Lip Cheese called. I step down into the single step. I, I step down the single step into the living room and sit on the carpet, which is marble blue, as if to imitate water, maybe. Mom leans back on the woolly mammoth, which she calls our sofa, stretching the punctures in the leather. Her work loafers are on, hanging above the carpet in a way that makes her stomach look inflated. Hey, Mom, I say. She keeps her eyes on the TV, where, on Letterman, which she takes in like news, a robot with Bill Clinton's head shoots lasers out of its eyes at a bag of french fries. So I go, I don't know, I just wanted to ask. I'm just worried that, it's just, I'm just worried that, I don't know, I just feel sometimes like, I don't know, it's just that I'm worried that. You're worried what, she says. I don't bother finishing, and I take the cordless phone to bed with me in case it rings and it's necro. Lights on. I stare at the glow in the dark stars I pasted to my ceiling in fifth grade and try to form constellations. The bright nippled astronaut. The talking sump pump. A constellation that looks like a bird, then a mustache, then a bird, then a mustache, then a bird. Then I got mad because I can never concentrate, and whenever I can concentrate, it's during times like when I'm brushing my teeth, and I'll splash water on a moth in the sink until it squirms down the drain, like I just killed something on total cruise control, like I might blink my eyes one afternoon while mowing the lawn, and when I, when I open them, I'll be in a friendlies with a knife in my hands and a waiter on the floor. So I roll over. The next morning, the phone is twisted up in the, into the corner of my pillowcase when I wake up, but there's freshness in my, in my muscles and eyes, like the first day back from the flu, like I could call somebody Colonel Hellstash and mean it. Which thank God, because I will need it today. Because hear that noise from one bedroom over, over like metal train gears? It's mom and fake dad number three. Their lovemaking sounds angry, like slapped mozzarella and ground teeth. A real Alaskan meteor shower. The reflection, the reflection in my framed machine gun, machine gun Kelly poster, his right arm angled to throw the football, is vibrating. Alaskan meteor shower, Somerville catcher's mitt, Twin Cities yogurt bowl, real dad's phrases. The idea being that if you combine any geographic location with any item, it'll sound like a sex term. Which he came up with after he moved out and blew all his money on garbage pail kids, collector's pest dispensers, and Halloween themed LPs. My point being, fake dad number three's condo's gas heater is broken, so he's staying here. He owns more purple things, bathrobes, the velvet padding in his acoustic guitar case than I have ever seen ever. I go down the hall with the phone and into the living room to watch some HBO, which real dad ordered but mom forgot to cancel. Summers, in this living room, I'd crank the box fan and move it from the door well, where mom always kept it, to right next to his recliner, and his fallen out ponytail hair snared on the fan grates. And when I was younger, pants in Nintendo phase, and needed to lock, look out our sliding door at night because I was scared someone was out there, he'd let me look until I was sure. Nobody's out there, Nate, Mom said. As in, here's Mom now, fully pantsuited, the curls in her bird's nest of hair sharpened with sweat, and fake dad number three, with his Thor blonde page boy cut, trimmed beard, and silk R&B pajamas, <laughs> coming into the kitchen for some post-Oakland tire fire lunch. <laughs> Leaf Thunder Trident is what I call him, for obvious reasons. Fake Dad number three leads, leans against the living room's entrance, chest and face still pencil eraser pink. He dangles one foot from the single step going down into the living room. Welcome to the day, mister, he says, voice a little woodsy and hoarse. I trust you dreamt fulfillingly, which makes you want to staple his face to a moving train. I shoulder brush past Fake Dad number three and go into the kitchen. 
our fridge is puckered shut, and I nearly, nearly lose my balance opening it to get my morning Gatorade. Fake dad number three sits down at the table in what used to be my seat and crosses his legs at the thighs. Maybe it's because I've been touching people more, because I'm licensed now, but you've appeared in my dreams quite a bit, Nate, he says, which is creepy enough to make diapers wet themselves. Last night, I dreamt Reiki Massage hired you as my assistant. When customers would look through our CD booklet and request music to enhance their session, no matter what the album request, you put in this Megadeth album that you brought with you. A request for Zakir Hussein, you put in Megadeth. A request for GM Bala Subramanian, the Carnatic vocalist, Megadeth, piping into the massage studio. It keeps deciding for me, you said over and over, hopelessly. But at the end of their session, customers came out, revitalized as ever. He pauses, like he's waiting for me to be amazed. Thank you, I say. Maybe you'd be good at it, he says. A good worker, a good, and he pauses, toucher. <laughs> Mom stabs the pan with the spatula. She doesn't scramble eggs so much as make Nerf pancakes. Gareth, Nate doesn't care about work. Nate cares about, cares about what, Mom? Cares about what, I say. Nate cares about Applebee's and Necro and helping Toby pick up prostitutes at the mall. Funny, Mom. Ha, 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 ha. Necro's got a job at Kodak, and, to and Toby's 22 now. He's got his own place. Well, I doubt that will last very long. Not on his budget. She laughs. When Mom actually does laugh, it's one word. Ha. The plate Mom sets in front of me wobbles flat, like when a quarter runs out of a spin. But what does a dream like that tell you, Nate? That you still have to work on Kinko's at Sunday? On, that you still have to work at Kinko's on weekdays? He nods and twists his goatee with his thumb and index finger. That's fair. That's fair, he says. My only point, Nate, is that the bad decisions are just as good as the good decisions. After several bad decisions amid a time of deep per per personal turbulence in Kafard, I came to understand that I was touring the Yemeni city of Taiz. And as I became more consumed with the turbulence, I woke up in my hotel room one morning, one morning to find myself blind in my right eye. My vision would later return, but right then, I threw out my maps and wandered east for days among the cot fields. A group of teenagers driving an El Camino with a howitzer mounted to the back pulled up next to me. A boy in a Walter Payton jersey approached me, drew a glass shard or perhaps a jambia, and screamed at me in maybe a form of Zabidi. Gareth, Mom says, laughing one ha. You didn't have an itinerary? I was a journeyman, fake dad number three says. I was taking in the stars. When life gives you lemons, you live. <laughs> when the phone rings, I forget it's been in my lap, and I scoop it before it hits the floor and run into the hallway. The background noise on Necro's end sounds like rows of shopping carts crashing over and over. We're going to take and go to Weapon Man at seven, he yells in his Section 8 Merman Riot voice, like he's giving orders, not even saying hey or sorry I didn't call back. What? I yell back. Where were you? I was worried. Textbook Colonel Halstash. Take and b move now, he yells again. We're all going to take and go to Weapons of... Meet Toby, Lipschitz, and Wicked College John. Take and go to Kodak Park, which is already bad sign number one. Two out of every five Colonel Hellstash nights, historically, have begun with Necro calling and yelling at me in his Section 8 Merman riot voice. And I wonder if I should bring him the scrap of paper that only had the word fuck written on it, which Mom found in my closet when she was stuffing my old clothes into garbage bags and hanging up her blouses so I could tell Necro, Remember when we found this certificate of fuck downtown at the Pontillos where the telephones were answered by cats? Which maybe he'd like, and it would distract him from being Section 8 merman. Then I say, almost by accident, maybe I am too old for this. Or maybe what I really want is to be old so I can stay in without worrying. But, as with most other points in my life, I'm opening the sliding door of my bedroom closet to get my bills jacket and leaving. Going out with Necro, Mom says, when I walk back out into the kitchen. Necro? What? Fake dad number three says. His name is Andrea. We call him Necro, I say. He moved from Louisiana, Mom says. The Fanto family, an army family. Nate dropped his MCC classes. She slows her voice down and lowers it to impersonate Necro so they could take and run away and get married. Ha, 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 Mom. Real original. Ha, 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 ha. Well, fake dad. Well... Fake dad number three says, almost lispily, does he stick around at night? Which you could even ask 13 nights ago, on New Year's Eve, the second to last time Necro, me, Toby, and Lipchies would all stick around in the same place together. The ball dropped and, hours later, the channels went to carpet deodorant commercials. 
miles of not talking between us in my basement, sitting on the crusted over couch when Necro leaned forward, head between his knees, and then flung himself back into the couch violently, body bouncing forward slightly, squeaking the couch hinges, ponytail hairband flying off somewhere. Nobody spoke. The TV lit my basement's gray painted concrete floor like the light of a fish tank. Toby leaned into the armrest on one end of the couch. Lipchies, on the other, tucked his knees into his t-shirt, greasing up a pillowcase. We threw our jackets over ourselves, and on the floor, I slid my hands between my knees and we fell asleep. On New Year's Day evening, with hangover filth shrink wrapped to our tongues, we woke up. The sun was almost down, like a nectarine cooling on ice. It felt like every Sunday evening ever condensed, drifting in thicker than dishwasher steam. And there was no way I would even say 30 words that day. We high-stepped through the snow in my front yard to go to Toby's car and drove to maybe Jay's or the Heimlet for an omelet. And outside, it was 1999. And that's it. That was great. Um, so, hi, I'm Johnny. I'm uh, Nathan Larson's publisher at Akashic Books. And I'd like to start by thanking, and there's Arthur Narcessian. <laughs> um, and I'd like to start by thanking Margarita and the, and the bookshop here for hosting this event. And um, I think that everyone should uh, take the opportunity to, to pay your rent for the evening um, by buying either Bill's book or one of Nathan's two books. And, and I think you should, because you guys are such a good audience, you should do something for yourself and buy a second book. I might recommend the new Juno Diaz book or perhaps Zadie Smith. Um, but, uh, and there's, oh, a new Dave Eggers book. Wow, you could be the coolest person in the world if you bought those three books. Um, and you would also help uh, St. Mark's to continue to be able to provide this kind of space for, uh, for readings. Um, so actually, please give Margarita a round of applause. Um, so I published Nathan Larson, and uh, these, he's, he's published two books. He's, m some people know him through his, music, mu his other creations as a musician, both making music and also scoring film. But he's writing now, and he's a killer writer. This is the first book in the series, The Dewey Decimal System, and then just recently we published The Nervous System. And um, Nathan will give you a little bit of a taste of this. Um, and he's a pleasure to work with, and um, please join me in welcoming Nathan Larson. Thank you so much. Johnny, you're too kind. This is the love fest up in here. I'm gonna, this was bugging me the whole time. Let me just fix, let me just tech this here real quick. I'm a music guy, I like to tech stuff. So y'all, thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, like Johnny was saying, this, uh, these bookstores, this, these places, are the, these are the centers of our community in a lot of respect and when uh, places like this go, you know, they're gone and, and, and uh, they leave a huge hole. So let's support this spot and um, others like it. Um, okay, I, uh, as Johnny mentioned, I have written uh, what is uh, going to be three books um, in a series about a very damaged man. Um, and he has uh, all kinds of dis disorders. He suffers from OCD and PTSD and everything else. Uh, he returns, presumably, from uh, some sort of military uh, conflict uh, to a very, uh, itself a wounded uh, city, the city of his birth, New York, which has been sort of trashed by what we assume are uh, large-scale terrorist attacks and is reduced to sort of an assortment of um, construction sites. Um, Given his sort of problems, he needs to come up with a solution and uh, to uh, he needs to come up with something to give his life some structure. So he develops something he calls the system, which is not just a uh, a uh, means to get through the day, but it's also sort of it's very specific uh, in terms of navigational. Um, and uh, uh, for instance, the guy can't take a left before uh, 11 a.m. Or no, sorry, he only takes left before. Let me, I, it's, it's confusing for even me, and I wrote the thing. Um, 
So he's 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 a, he's a bit of an odd guy. Uh, he's taken up residence in the New York Public Library, the main branch, and uh, is uh, known as Dewey Decimal because he is rearranging the stock according to the decimal system, which of course is an impossible task. But there we are. So uh, again, this is a series. This is book two. So I'm going to start. Um, this gentleman is trying to clean up the mess that he made in the first book. He's trying to expunge himself from the records of this, uh, from his old boss's office. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it here. This is the nervous system. <coughs> no more digressions. Came here to the former district attorney's corner office to make double positive my tracks were covered. Pull off the surgical gloves, lob them at the overflowing trash bin. Messy, messy, messy. Produce a bottle of Purell TM. Squirt a bit in my left palm and rub vigorously, scanning the room. The office appears exactly as it did in my last visit. And my former boss, District Attorney Daniel Rosenblatt, has been dead for, what, six weeks? I should know I shot the man myself. Unhygienic elements abound like there on the desk. Half a submarine sandwich peppered with mold, a sad bit of pickle. Balled up nap napkins, wax paper bearing the word subway. Get the shivers, think poor air circulation, floating spore colonies, readjust my procedure mask to securely cover my nose and mouth. But it's not the filth that bothers me most, because for dirt, I'm more than properly equipped. It's the chaos, the disorder, the lack of methodology. My system, with a capital S, abhors disorder. I spent half a year in the dead DA's employ, partic in activities I don't want to dis discuss. Judge not, that shit was a living, and it kept me in pills, pistachios, and Purell, TM, the three Ps essential to my continued well-being. Donning a set of new gloves, I exhale, and maybe 45 minutes of solid rummaging through the blackmail files crawl by, in which I've learned, A, former comptroller Ray Stevens has or had a revolving stash of six to ten-year-old Dominican girls in the basement of his Hamptons hideaway, shackled to metal rings in the floor, if I read the photos correct. It sounds extremely naughty, but perhaps that's just what comptrollers do. I've also learned, B, the former mayor is in business with Russian slash Chinese slash Ukrainian crime outfits, collects his pound of flesh from each and every construction firm in town. No shock there. I recognize some names in there, particularly the, the Ukrainians as well. Current state senator representing the 15th Congressional District in Harlem, just a touch over from the territory of my childhood. Sired a child with a certain Korean hooker who was then most conveniently found dismembered along with the child in a barrel of kimchi. It's a laugh line. This led to a quote unquote 32nd Street Massacre, which the NYPD has always claimed was triggered by the well intentioned, if, if clumsy, attempts to quell a Korean turf war. Et fucking cetera. Yawn, stretch, all these goddamn documents, but I'm none the wiser with respect to my own status. Hit the ensuite half bath. Mirror, mirror, wringing my hands with rubbing alcohol over the sink. I spy a thin, dark skinned male of mixed pedigree in a hat, tasteful dark brown suit, knitted charcoal tie. Maybe mid 40s, though it's hard to say, given that those of us who have survived this, this far now possess the dried up look of the malnourished yoga obsessive or a late stage HIV sufferer. The blue surgical mask perhaps clashes, but it is not an accessory. It is for my own protection. Leaning closer, my nose will never exactly be the same, and the amateur stitch job on my cheekbone has left behind a jerky swipe of discoloration. The scab on my lips is constantly cracking even now, so it remains practically an open wound. If you observed me walking, you'd see that I have a fairly pronounced limp and favor my left leg. You would too if you'd had your kneecap blown off. Otherwise, I like to imagine I caught a dashing figure. Even the limp bestows a certain casual elegance. See me on the street? You'd reckon I got a style all my own and Tony places to be. Exclusive spots way the fuck out of your league. Add the rubber gloves, <laughs> the face mask. I reckon it lends a whiff of the mysterious. That is yo. I like to think so. Back at his desk, I withdraw a bottle of Grey Goose vodka from the lower left-hand drawer and a couple of loose Cohiba Coronos Especiales. Here's that cigar clipper with the man's engraved initials. Fucking jackass. 
Douse the place in spirits, around in a circle twice. Take a final look around. Out the window, the great Woolworth building, visible due northeast, about to be outdone again, once they wrap up that new Freedom Tower piece of shit for the second time yet. Frisk myself, locate a book of matches, reading Millennium Hotel. Gives me a little zing. Obviously, I haven't been smoking much lately. There in the doorway, I take a moment to scrub those paws good with the Purell TM and kit up with a fresh mask and set of gloves. Clip the tip off a cohiba, jam it between my split lips and spark a match. With the flame applied, I rotate the cigar, getting a nice even cherry going. Flick the match back into the office. It hits a stack of documents. Whoosh! Manila and paper go up in hot blue. The flame charges right, chasing its tail. The room blossoms fire, waiting for an alarm. The sprinklers, cops, movement, anything, something, doesn't happen. Because like everything and everybody in this ghost town, like my knee, like my head, like my heart, everything is broken, everything is barely there. Limping up the marble stairs that lead to the main branch, I shift the box of files to one arm and tap the southernmost lion's stone ass. That system protocol with a capital S. A tap on my way out, and a tap on the way in, balance, people. Twin monster cats keeping vigil over my home here at 42nd and 5th Avenue. Again, balance. I take a moment to groove on it all, apply, applying Purell TM as I do so. Clean of hand is clear of mind. I just made that shit up. <laughs> and now the words repeat it to myself. Clean of hand is clear of mind. Now by some miracle, the Beaux Arts facade of the library remains as magnificent as ever, pretty much unblemished. In the darker hours, such as the Sunday evening in mid-September, automated floodlights illuminate the building even now. One or two have burned out, and I wonder how long the surviving lights have yet to live. I will mourn them when they go, believe me. I peep south. You could roll a skull down Fifth Avenue. Absolutely zero traffic. Dead quiet, with the exception of a distant metallic hubbub a construction site to the east, the night crew going at it. Get itchy around crowds. That's where true believers go to blow themselves up, right to the dead center of a nice crowd. That's why today's New York City couldn't be a better spot for a cat like me. In that sense, this town is very much improved. I should know. I'm the original native son. The air is getting steadily worse, if that's possible, or at least that's my perception. The stench, with a capital S, which has been brutal since February 14th, is now actively visible. A jaundiced haze of burnt plastic, burning oil, and smoldering trash. Hard to go more than five blocks without feeling a tightening in the, in the chest. Shortness of breath comes off the water, out of the ground, rains from the rancid sky. Gets in the eyes and nostrils, glassy little particles, fat snowflakes of ash. I see it in the floodlights, a slow-moving yellow fog. Shiny bits wink at me like glitter. You can learn to live with anything, and that's the real. Upstairs in the grand hall known as the Rose Reading Room formerly, I shove the box of documents beneath the bench nearest to the corner where I keep my shit. Strip down to my boxers, shrugging off my shoulder holster, which stinks of sweat. Stow the guns, carefully hang up my suit on a plastic Century 21 hanger. I'm jumping around because uh, with these kind of mystery things, you don't want, you know, I don't want to give away the story. Um, let me see here. I'll give you some more textural stuff, right? Later on, two stepping at North up Fifth, realizing I feel good back on my grind. Important to have projects, goals, even if they're not immediately clear to anyone. Group of Central American thugs slouching on a corner. One of them gives yours truly an eye frisk, then returns to his can of SpaghettiOs, probably trying to figure out what's next after the Chinese gave his people the racial high hat Thugs, scavengers, and gypsies every which way, disgruntled worker bees looking to smash and grab, and who can blame them? A big industrial boom in the sky draws my attention northward, top of the empire. Something hypnotic about the incessant comings, comings and goings around the tower on that iconic building. I pause. What the fuck are they doing up there? As far as I can recall, there wasn't any major structural damage to the empire, just the shooting on the observation deck, a replay of the shootings in that same spot back in 1997. Details are spotty. A lot of people got dead. 
But that event was overshadowed and sidelined by the larger whole of February 14th. I reckon blowing up the Brooklyn Bridge upstage most everything, as dramatic and sexy a terrorist act can get, even if it didn't quite take the structure down. Highly visual, the exacting distribution of the explosives, boom, boom, boom. If you're into career demolition, where do you go from there? How do you top it? I didn't witness the event myself, but it must have been some spectacular theater. Strikes me concerning the Empire State as I watch a crane heft a massive girder. They're actually constructing something new up there, visible perhaps from above, maybe from the upper floors of the Chrysler or 15 pen. Clock the helicopters buzzing around the spire like hummingbirds, always with the helicopters, be they NYPD, Apaches, and Super Cobras, or matte black and unmarked, vibing Roswell, enhanced interrogation, secret CIA prisons. Ah, the, familiar, the familiar, familiarity of such stuff should relax me. I did enough time in such twilight zones, but it doesn't. Ghetto birds make me nervous. They always have, especially now. Catch myself standing out in the wide open, wrenching my neck backwards, spacing out, sloppy. Time to step. Pop a pill, pull up my surgical mask. Continue north, trying to put some space between myself and freaky dick Korea town. Mere blocks away, and it gets quiet in a hurry as I move beyond the construction sites. And splat, something gray hits the sidewalk in front of me. Jump back. That there's a dead pigeon. Wham, make that a pair. I look up, slide back against a building. A third, smack. Christ, even the vermin are jumping ship. Take a moment, sneak another pill. Psyching myself out again, it's easy to wander into that headspace. Again, I think of snipers, but I have some ground in context now, and I don't let myself slide down that slope. Need to cook up a plan, make some power moves. Fucking drag about my suit. Try finding an operative dry cleaner in this fucking beat down ghost town. You think with all these Chinese, hold on, that's straight racist, and this brother shuts that line of thinking down. One time I got so desperate to get my thread shiny, I busted into a boarded up dry cleaner on Grand Street, way east, distributing a huge community of raccoons. Raccoons in a dry cleaners on fucking Grand Street, like a dozen of them, believe it or not, raccoons. Big motherfuckers, too. <clears throat> Getting towards the end here now. Ghosts pursue me up the FDR, shrieking and raging. Ghosts increasing in number and ferocity. I flee them at a gallop. Drilling it, hit Harlem River Drive, Major Deegan, exit 13. Flash through neighborhoods long ago emptied of anything organic. Stand before the Gun Hill houses. Behold the architectural cruelty of American public housing. Behold the banality of economic segregation, of slow genocide. Observe the empty playground and the singularly ghetto debris strewn here and there. 40 ounce bottles of old English malt liquor, Doritos bags, chicken bones, a stray toddler sized Rockaware sneaker. Note all of this, disregard it, move, enter the building. All surfaces are subway car metallic impervious to graffiti. Enter the elevator, which is functioning tonight for some reason. Enter a mist of, mi mist of old piss and mold. I always blow that. I gag. Press the correct button with my elbow. Exit the elevator. Follow the hallway to the correct door. Shift the bag of dried octopus to the other hand. Take out the key. Key and lock. Listen to the door. Weapon out, just in case. Open the door. Approximately 4.15 <coughs> a.m. Finds, finds me propelling the Chevy Volt southward. Senator Koch is spread out in the back seat secured and compliant. I'm alone with the city at, in that ungodly hour, the hour of the wolf, when even an all but abandoned metropolis takes on yet another dimension of strangeness. Ghosts hound me all the way downtown, howling, making demands I don't understand. Pedal fully depressed, and I don't dare look back, no, not for an instant. I possess a certain tranquility, and I honor the system by observing the correct routing Bronx River Parkway to the Bruckner Expressway, exit to Bruckner Boulevard, cross at Third Avenue Bridge, onto the back onto the FDR Drive, which will carry us ultimately to the Brooklyn Bridge. Mindful travel. I force a peaceful kickoff to a day that will very likely plunge me into some fresh abyss. I wear my unremarkable gray suit as if headed to an office job, shoulder holster under my jacket with my freshly clean CZ 99 15 round magazine. At my belt, I carry the diver's knife. Ankle holster with the P290, six rounds in the clip. On the front passenger seat, 
I have my bag with the senator's file retrieved from the air vent and all accompanying digital media. Meditate now on the impermanence of our institutions, our monuments to ourselves. Certainly, we have seen a great many of these massive shrines to our ambition fall, dissolved, be reduced to ash. After the rickety wooden UN underpass at about 39th Street, I look west at the spotty lights of the Chrysler Building and experience a profound rush of sadness accompanied with a reminder. As the Buddha teaches, a denial of one's true nature and clutching at perishable and changeable things can only result in acute suffering and people, I do suffer acutely and shower this anguish on all who come near me. Spiritual reconstructive surgery is required should I survive the next few hours. That's my next big to-do on my extremely short to-do list, which at the moment sounds a little something like this. To-do, one, organize books at the library according to decimal system. One A, don't die. <laughs> Two, as in to be determined. But fuck such musing, silly rabbit. Tricks are for kids. I gotta stay good, I gotta stay gold. Keep tight on the road. The ghosts hang back, perhaps sensing my resolve. Headlights hit the sign for exit two, Brooklyn Bridge, Manhattan Civic Center. But it is necessary that we pass this up, come back around, in order to avoid violating the no left turn edict of my system. Attain the on-ramp. Screech slide the vault to a sideways halt at the head of the bridge above what I know to be the appropriately named Rose Street. Let's do this thing and let's get it done. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for coming out tonight.